So I'll say this today also, just like I say um, with Mother's Day, that we're well aware that Mother's Day and Father's Day um, carries with it uh, some different emotions for, for different people. And, and a lot of that depends on um, your relationship with your earthly father. Um, and a lot of it depends on if you still um, you know, have your earthly father living here on earth also. And so I know that um, a, a lot of it you know, there's a lot of different emotions that play a part, and I just want to encourage you this morning, my, the guy who was my youth pastor uh, just a few years ago when I was in high school, he sends out a text message every Sunday morning to a group of pastors, and, and I'm lucky enough to be included in that. And this morning, he sent out his text message, and, and he talked about something that I think, I hope encourages you today, and that our Heavenly Father is, is not just a promise maker, but he's a promise keeper. And, and so regardless of whether or not you have a good relationship with your earthly father or not, our heavenly father is, is there and, and is just so faithful and so good and never lets us down and never leaves us and never forsakes us. And so regardless of what your experience is, I hope that just encourages you uh, just to know that there's a faithful God who, who really does enjoy serving the purpose of our Heavenly Father. And, and so I hope that encourages you today. <clears throat> In regards to what we're going to talk about today, the Lord never ceases to amaze me. On, on how he works everything out. And when we laid out the series for Philippians months ago, months ago we broke down the book of Philippians, okay, these verses on this day and these verses on that day and so on and so forth. So the verses that we're going to cover today was established months ago. And it just so happens that the verses we're going to look at today, verses 17 through 30 of chapter 2, Talk about three men and, and the example of these three men that, that you and I can learn from, that, that you and I can look at their example, hopefully learn from their example and be better off because of it. And, and so, you know, guys on, on Father's Day here, I'm glad that you're here. I really am glad that we had a good turnout in the first service and some, some people are watching online. If we, if we look to these examples... If we learn from these examples, I think it's safe to say we're going to be in pretty good shape. Like we're, we're going to be striving to be the men that God has called us to be. So, so even though we're talking about three men, I hope that every single one of us can learn from the examples of the guys that we're going to look at in this particular passage of Scripture. Now, it is true that Paul is writing this section of Philippians to inform the believers in Philippi that, hey, you know, be on the lookout because I'm going to send you Timothy and Epaphroditus to come spend some time with you in the future. But I don't think that is the only reason why he shared what he shared. Because most of the time, that type of information is usually included at the end of a letter that he wrote to a particular church. Kind of like a, oh, by the way, type thing. Oh, one more thing. And before I forget, you know, Timothy and Epaphroditus are going to be coming your way shortly. So I, I don't think that is his reasoning for including it where he does in this particular letter to the church in Philippi. Because it's right smack in the middle of the letter, maybe so that it's not just an afterthought, but it's a teaching moment. It's an important teaching moment that, hey, let's pay attention to the example of these three guys so that we can put into practice some of those same things and we can benefit from their example. I really believe that that is why Paul includes it where he does in this particular letter. Now, it's no secret, and we've talked about this a lot lately, but at the end of chapter 1 and beginning of chapter 2, Paul really makes a big emphasis on humility and the desire to be unified amongst the body of Christ. 
And, and we went through a, a whole list of things that should be found in our lives and, and having the same mind and being a full of cord and having the same love and, and making sure that we're not just concerned about our own interests, but we're going to be concerned about the interests of others and we're going to count others more significant than ourselves. And all of these things are talked about in Philippians chapter 2. And then Paul gives us the greatest example possible to follow in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Matt talked about two weeks ago. How even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so he was willing to humble himself, empty himself, and take on the form of a servant. And be obedient to death, even death on the cross. And what an example we have to follow through Jesus Christ. And so all these things are being talked about. And so after he gives the example of Jesus, he then tells us to work out our salvation. And we talked about that last week. And how it's really important that we understand that Paul is not saying that we have to work and do a bunch of things to be saved. But because we're saved, there's things that we should be doing. That there's a lifestyle that we should be living. And so, yes, God is going to be the one working in and through us, but we are to be taking on the characteristics of Christ. And and so Paul is talking about all of these different things, and he just talks about this example of Jesus. And this is where a lot of people find it very difficult. Because as Christians, we look at the example of Jesus... And it's so easy if we're not if we're not careful to think and say, well, that's Jesus. Right? I mean, it's easy for Jesus because he's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. We know none of us are Jesus, right? We all have our our shortcomings and we all fall way short of the glory of God. But it's so easy to be looking at the example of Jesus and think, well, there's no way I can do that. I mean, it is not possible for me to live the life like Jesus lived the life. So that's why I think Paul goes into, in this particular section of Scripture, to give examples. I'm not real crazy about this term, but I'm going to use it again, of the common man. Now, I'm not, I do not refer to the Apostle Paul as the common man. (laughs) I mean, the Apostle Paul is just an unbelievable follower of Jesus Christ. But if you're going to try to look at your life compared to somebody else, and yes, we should be striving to be like Jesus, but it's so much easier to say, that's Jesus, I'll never be like that. But hey, you know what? I can do some of the same things Paul's doing. I can do some of the same things Timothy's doing. I can do some of the same things that Epaphroditus is going to be doing. And so I think he uses the example of these three guys so that we're not just sitting back saying, you know what, there's no way that I can do this. This is so unrealistic. I mean, this is Jesus we're talking about, right? Jesus is is perfect, and he's sacrificial, and he's selfless. And, And, you know, Jesus doesn't struggle with the same things I struggle with. Like, Jesus doesn't have a sin nature like I have. And Jesus isn't prone to evil like I am. Like, there's no way that I can possibly do this. Therefore, this is why I think he uses three examples of men who are working out their salvation so that we can learn from their example. So Paul is going to first of all reference himself, then he's going to talk about Timothy, and then he's going to talk about Epaphroditus, who moving forward in the message, we'll call him Epap, all right? I do not want to say Epaphroditus every single time I make reference to him in this message. So he's going to be Epap, all right? So we've got, now now see what they all do here, right? we got Paul the apostle, we've got Timothy the minister, and we got Epap the volunteer. That covers everybody. So regardless of where you are in your journey, in your faith journey, regardless of where you are and how you view yourself even as an active person in our church, that covers everybody. And each of these three individuals are going to be committed to a certain thing. Three different things, okay? So let's start with Paul and look, let's look at his commitment of zeal. Now zeal is not a word that we necessarily like, you know, throw around real often. So what, what does he mean? Paul was energetic. Paul was passionate. Paul was enthusiastic. 
Like, like I, I have a hard time seeing the Apostle Paul walking around on this earth doing the things that Christ has called him to do with an attitude like, well, I don't know, you know, I guess, yeah, I guess I'll do it. You know, just all boring and melancholy. No, I, when I think about Paul, I see about, I, I look at somebody with a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of enthusiasm and everything he did for the Lord, he gave everything he had in his service to God. So this is what he says about himself beginning in verse 17. Even if I am to be pour out, poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, when someone would make an animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, what they would do is, as the sacrifice was burning on the altar, some, not everybody, but some would pour wine or they would pour some type of perfume on the sacrifice while it was burning, and so it would, it would let off this, this smoke or, or this mist that would you know, appear for a little bit and then just disappear. So what Paul's saying here is that I'm willing to be poured out as a drink offering and do anything I can. Maybe it's something little. Maybe it's a lot. Maybe I'll be around for a short amount of time. Maybe I'll be around for a long amount. It doesn't matter. I am here to serve you and enhance your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He he constantly lived a life of sacrifice. And he was always ready and willing to, to lay aside everything. He didn't do it for personal gain. He didn't do it for personal glory. He didn't do it for wealth. He did it so that other people could benefit in their relationship with Christ. But ultimately, it was done for the benefit of Christ. And he put everything he had into serving Jesus and serving other people. Once again, I don't think think Paul was walking around like Eeyore saying, well, you know what, nobody else is gonna do it. Oh, go ahead, sign me up, you know. I don't really want to, but I, no, I don't think that was the Apostle Paul. I I think he was so eager to be used by Christ and and, and he was just always looking for opportunities to, to serve Christ by serving other people and he was filled with so much enthusiasm. So guys, as we're leading our families, as we're loving our families, as we're serving our families, our families are gonna be better off when we're doing that with as much enthusiasm and energy, and passion as we can. I mean, think about it. Our families are not necessarily going to benefit, even if we're doing the things we're supposed to be doing, but we're we're like, well, I don't really want to, but, you know, I guess I will, you know. For your sake, you're welcome, you know, any of that type of mindset. But no, we we are enthusiastically leading and loving and serving our families, We are doing it with as much energy as we have. We're doing it with as much passion as we have. Why? Because we know that our families are going to benefit from it. And the family of God is going to benefit from it. Paul had this this zeal about him. Now here's what a lot of people probably don't think about in regards to Paul. Paul could have very easily made a very lucrative career out of doing something other than what he was doing. Well, he could have had a much easier life than what he ended up having because he said yes to Christ. I mean, you think about it, right? Paul could have very easily just went to a small town and got nice and cozy and comfortable, you know, maybe, maybe taught like in the, in the college there or something, maybe wrote some books on theology, you know, and, and life could have been very enjoyable for Paul. But we see through studying the life of Paul that Paul went through all of these hardships and persecution and imprisonment All of that could have been avoided if he chose to do something else. But do you know what I believe? And I haven't asked Paul this yet, but I will one day. I believe that Paul knew that if he was doing anything other than what Christ has called him to do, he was going to be miserable. He was going to be miserable. 
because he wasn't doing what Jesus wanted him to do. Right? Paul had a trade. Paul, Paul was a tent maker. I mean, he could have he could have very easily, you know, made the tents that that Chad Henman then rents to people. I mean, they could have worked together like hand in hand. You know, he he could have very easily done that and, and avoided all of the pain and and the heartache in his life. But he would have been miserable because any time, and I'm not just talking about people in full time ministry, but any time a follower of Christ is not being used in the way because they're not willing to say yes to the way that Christ wants to use them, there's a spirit of frustration. There's a spirit of discontent when we're not doing what God has called us to do. And we each have to figure that out of what that looks like. Now, over the years, and I will say this hasn't happened as much lately, (laughs) thank God, but over the years, I've had a lot of conversations with myself um, in regards to, and, and let me say this, let me preface what I'm about to say. I am not downplaying any one of your jobs that happens to be a nine to five. I'm not doing that. But, but I've, I've thought over the years at times, man, what would life be like if I worked a nine to five? Like, like what would life be like for me If I went somewhere and I clocked in and I did my work and I got paid and I clocked out and I went home and I didn't necessarily have to think about work anymore until the next morning when I'm in the parking lot and I'm contemplating my life's choices about what I need to go in and do. And some of you are like, I know exactly what you're talking about. And every single one of those conversations that I've had with myself has always ended up the same way. The Lord has always convinced me in my heart, Craig, it doesn't matter what you would be doing. It doesn't matter how much money you would be making. You would be absolutely miserable if you weren't doing what I called you to do. And and that that doesn't just go for full-time ministry. Anything the Lord is laying on your heart to do, when you're not doing it, There's just something inside of you that is just not content, right? Like, ah, man, there's something more that God wants me to do. You think about Paul. He he was not in it for the personal gain and glory and wealth. He he wanted to be poured out uh, as a sacrifice on the altar of sacrifice for Christ by serving other people, That was his life purpose. He said that his life was nothing more than a puff of smoke that went up when you poured the wine and the perfume on on the altar, on the sacrifice. That's all his life was. Now let me say this. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be in full-time ministry. And if you're not called in the full-time ministry, that's the last place you should be. Because you're going to be miserable miserable in full-time ministry if you're not called to full-time ministry. So what I'm saying is this, though, whatever God has called you to do, whoever he has called you to love and lead and serve, we need to do it with zeal. We need to do it with enthusiasm. We need to do it with energy. We need to do it with passion. We need to pour everything we have into doing what God has called us to do. Jesus, the greatest example of true humility he, he, he models this in the fact that Jesus was willing to leave the comforts of heaven to come down and, and still count equality with God, not something that he was going to be able to grasp. So he was willing not only to come to earth, but he was willing to empty himself and humble himself and become a servant to serve God and serve other people and help them get close to God. What, what a perfect example for us to follow, and Paul is saying, hey, I want you guys to know that I want to be that example to you. Paul is saying, I'm willing to practice what I preach. I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. I'm going to give everything I have to serve Jesus and serve you. Now, guys, when, when you give everything you have to love your family, to lead your family, to serve your family, you do realize that there's no guarantee that everything's going to be easy. In fact, it's not going to be easy. 
It's going to be hard, harder at some times than others. It may not be easy, but it's never going to be wrong. It's always going to be the right thing to do. There's always going to be benefit sometime. It may not be immediately. It may not be right now. But you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you'll see it. One day, you will see it. So let's learn from the example of Paul having a commitment of zeal. Here's number two, Timothy and his commitment of affection. Timothy's going to show us the example of how, how committed he was with his heart, with his affection. Have you ever, ever been around someone that was doing something, but you knew that their heart wasn't in it? Like, like you can see that, right? We're, we're, we're smart enough to see that play out. It, it, it's not just that, you know, we're doing the things we're supposed to be doing, but we're going to see from Timothy that he had an incredible heart behind him doing what he was called to do. He was a man of great affection. We, we see this beginning in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So, so Paul is still so optimistic about everything turning out the way that he hopes it would turn out. But, but I want to zero back in on verse 20 again. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Now, the original language is interesting here for two reasons. First of all, is that word concern there in verse 20? It's the same word that the New Testament uses for worry. It's the same word. Now, being concerned is not bad. Being worried, nothing good ever comes out of that, right? I mean, you think about the fact that worry is basically excessive concern. I mean, we, we worry and we're anxious, and, and it happened to me even this morning. I, I, I was in my office before first service, and I'm talking to Steph, and I'm like, I'm like man, I just, I, I'm anxious. Like, like, I, like, I'm nervous. Like, my heart's heavy. And she's like, why? I'm like, well, because I'm nervous about, like, going to camp for the first time again in 10 years. Like, being around them, I, I, just, I just want everything to go good. I want everything to be right, and, and knowing exactly what I'm going to be preaching on today. But, but yet it didn't stop me from, from having this spirit of, of worry and anxiousness, knowing that my worry has never changed the outcome of anything, and it doesn't stop us from worrying. So it's okay to be concerned, to care, but we don't have to necessarily worry. You think about a father. A father should have great concern. A husband should have great concern for his wife. A father should have great concern for his kids. What do I mean by that? I mean that your family is, is on your mind and in your heart often. Like you're always thinking about the well-being of your spouse and of your kids. And I wonder if we, I wonder if we feel that way. I wonder if we lead that way. I wonder if we love that way, that there's just a genuine concern for our family placed on us as our responsibility. The other item regarding the language used here may come out better in the King James Version. The, the verse 20 reads like this in the King James Version. For I have no man like-minded. Sound familiar? And he just got done telling us this earlier in chapter 2, right? That we need to be of the same mind. He's telling the Philippians once again, be like-minded. Doesn't mean you're a robot. Doesn't mean you can't think for yourself. But you're like-minded and keeping the main thing the main thing. And, and I personally think that Paul is drawing a, a connection here between what he's saying now and what he said earlier in chapter 2, because he goes on to say this about Timothy in verse 21. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. 
But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. So he's saying Timothy is a great example of what it looks like to have the same mind and not just look on his own interests, but to show love and affection and care for the other people. He's a great example of this. Now, I don't know if it played out like this or not, but when I read God's word, I kind of imagine scenarios. I kind of imagine how something happens. And so in this case, I'm kind of thinking that Paul has assembled his ministry team and he brings everybody together to try to figure out who's gonna go to Philippi and who's gonna minister to the people of Philippi while he's in prison. And it's almost like I get this idea that as he's talking to his ministry team, everybody on the ministry team but Timothy is looking away like, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. If I don't make eye contact with him, then he's probably not going to send me. You guys know how it is when, you, when you're with a group or a Bible study and they wrap up the end and like, hey, anybody want to close this in prayer? Don't look at him. Don't look at him. Don't make eye contact. If he doesn't see me, I'm not, he's not going to call on me to pray, right? We've, we've been there. And, and, and this is the same, I, I, I kind of imagine it playing out the same way where everybody's like, I'm not looking at him, I'm not looking at him. But then you have Timothy. And Timothy's over there like donkey in Shrek, right? Oh, pick me, pick me, pick me, I'll go, can I go? I want to go, please pick me, Paul. Like I really believe that that was, he, he was that way because he cared about the people so much. Timothy didn't end up going to the believers in Philippi because he draw the short straw and he lost the contest. I believe that he had a genuine concern and care for the people of Philippi. And they knew that. And you can kind of get the idea of that in just, you know, have how Paul is talking about Timothy. Now, I don't know why the others did what they did. And maybe they were concerned a little bit more about their well-being. Maybe they were thinking more about their own family and, and their security and their safety and their future. And I want you to know that those things are not bad things. But do you know what Timothy was convinced of? That God's will and God's people came before everything else. I must say yes. Whatever Paul needs me to do, I'm going to say yes. Why? Because he had a, a care for people. He had a heart for people. I mean, Timothy is doing what Christ himself did in saying that, you know, my own desires, my own goals, my, my own glory, I'm, I'm willing to, to lay all of that aside just to be used by Christ. Like, like, I, I'm not going to do it for the wrong reasons. I'm willing to go anywhere and do anything. Why? Because I love people and I want to help them follow Jesus. And I believe that we see this in the life of Timothy. So here's a question for you just to consider this morning. Do you have a real concern for the welfare of others? Now, before you, before you flippantly just respond with the, the answer that, you know, you're supposed to say, yeah, yeah, of course I do. You better believe it. Yeah, and maybe you do, and I'm not saying you don't. But I think it's so easy for us to be, to be so flippant and say, oh, yeah, absolutely. But when we really think about it and we really evaluate our life and the way we treat people and the way we love people and the way we serve people, do you truly have a deep concern for the well-being of other people? Do you have a real concern for your family? Well, of course I do. No, 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 think about it. Before just saying the right answer, make sure it's, it's true. Do you have a care and concern for your family? Guys, do you have a care and concern for your wife? Do you have a care and concern for your kids? Kids, do you have a care and concern for your parents? Like all of it works hand in hand here. And, and we learn this from the example of Timothy. It, it, it really makes the old adage true. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. It's so true. And I'm glad that there are many, and I'm not naming any names, I'm not even thinking about anybody right now, but I'm glad there are many self-proclaimed fountains of knowledge that exist in this world. But what does it matter if you have all of this knowledge, but nobody's going to listen to you 
because you don't care about them. Or they don't think you care about them. They don't think you love them. You can know everything there is to know about whatever you know about, but it doesn't do any difference at all in this world if nobody's going to listen to you. And I believe that people are more prone to listen to us when we know that we have a genuine care and affection from our heart about them, for them. I, I think about, I think this is true even in marriage. And, and I know we're not necessarily talking about marriage today, but do you realize that the key to a healthy marriage is not some feeling that you have for each other? Like, like you feel love a certain way and it, and it goes up and down your spine and gives you goosebumps and causes your heart to skip a beat every once in a while. And if that still happens in your relationship, great. But that's not the key to a healthy marriage. The key to a healthy marriage is being like-minded with your spouse about the things of Christ. About the things of Jesus. And this is what Jesus wants us to do. And this is what we should be paying attention to. And this is how we should be loving each other. And this is how we should be leading our kids. It lines up with the thoughts and the teachings of Christ. That's the key to a healthy marriage. To any healthy relationship. I mean unity and joy and contentment in the home. Can only be found when we try to emulate the example of Christ. But we also can learn from the example of Timothy. And that leads us to our final one, EPAP here, the commitment of risk. So Paul demonstrates the commitment of zeal, right? He's willing to pour out himself and exhaust himself for the benefit of other people. Timothy shows a commitment of the heart and that he cared so deeply and had this affection for people. But EPAP adds something else to the scene. Epap is a guy who was willing to risk it all for Jesus. He was always willing to go above and beyond the call of duty, so to speak, to serve Christ. And we see this beginning in verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So Epap was okay being a risk taker for Christ. Now let me say this. You don't have to almost die to be considered a risk taker for Jesus. Like, you know what? Yeah, I'm not not at that level yet. No, no. For some of you, it may simply mean this. Be willing to get out of your comfort zone. Be willing to be stretched into something that you're not comfortable doing. Or you're not comfortable playing a part as a volunteer in this ministry. Or maybe for some of you, you need to be stretched and you need to say yes to go with us to Guatemala next May. And you never ever thought about leaving this country. Whatever it is. That, that's, that would all fall under the umbrella of being a risk taker. Anytime you do something that you're not comfortable doing for Christ, you are considered a risk taker taker. And this is what Epap was doing in our story here. Now, we don't know anything else about Epap. We know that he's talked about here in chapter 2. He's also talked about in Philippians chapter 4. Now, what you need to understand and what we do gain from reading the verses here is that Epap's responsibility was, is when Paul became in need, When Paul needed food or he needed money or he needed clothes and the church in Philippi would gather all these things, Epap was then responsible to go to wherever Paul was and and relieve some of his burdens and say, here you go. This is from the church, right? This This is from the believers in Philippi. 
And so we see that on one of these trips that Epap makes to Paul, Epap gets really sick. Now, we don't know what the cause was or, or how bad off he was, but Paul says he almost died. And so now Epap comes to Paul to serve him and minister to him, but Paul ends up taking care of Epap and making sure that he doesn't die on his watch. Now, we know that this is his responsibility because in verse 25 of chapter 2, Paul calls him their messenger and minister to his need. So he's a layman. He's a, he's a volunteer. He, he's not, he's not full-time at the church. He, does, he doesn't get a paycheck from the church, which makes me believe, and, and, and I could be wrong, but I think this is a possibility, that EPAP did something else for a living. He did something else for a job so that he could get some money and take care of his own family. So think about this, and, and I'm not going to know this until I'm in heaven one day and I have a little conversation with Paul and Epap, all right? But until then, it makes me think that whenever this guy collected all these things that Paul needed, he had to leave his own job to go travel to where Paul was and give him the things that Paul needed, which makes me think that he risked possibly losing his own job to go serve Paul, to go minister to Paul. He he was willing to risk that to say yes to helping out Paul in his ministry. We don't know that for sure, but we do know that he risked his own well-being and health because on one of the trips it says he almost dies. He was a risk taker. He was willing to risk it all for Christ. It's no wonder that Paul says this about him in verse 29. Receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Church, we need to make sure that we are honoring those who are willing to risk it all for Jesus. To risk it all. We need to honor people like that. So my question is this. Are you willing to risk it all for Christ? Well, yeah, yeah, of course I am. Yeah, the the right answer is yes, right? I mean, yeah, of course. No, no, think about it. Are you willing to risk it all for Christ? Are you willing yourself to count equality with God not something to be able to grasp, so you're willing to humble yourself and take on the form of a servant and serve other people? Because I hope you realize that we're living in a day and age where if the Lord continues to tarry his coming, there's going to be a whole lot more risk involved in following Jesus. Like, we're, if the Lord tarries his return, there's going to be times in the near future where we're going, to be, we're going to have to risk it all for Christ. We're going to have some decisions that we're going to need to make. And it's going to be in front of us. And, and, and I know in the past, I've always, kind of, I've always kind of joked about this, but I've been kind of serious to where if I get thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, Somebody needs to come hook a brother up with a Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee every once in a while, right? I'm just saying. I had somebody leave after the first service and say, we'll bring you sweetest fish. I'm like, yes, right? Take care of my brother. Are you willing willing to risk it all for Christ? Because that risk is not just going to fall on the plate of a pastor. That's going to fall on anybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to be a risk taker? I hope you can see why Paul couldn't wait until the end of Philippians chapter 4 to say, oh, by the way, I'm sending Timothy and Epap to come you know, hang out with you guys for a little bit. I, I hope we can see why it was so important for him to say what he said about those men right now in the middle of the letter so that we could see it and we could learn from the example of these guys. Because I don't care who you are, I don't care what your situation is like or anything and what your family dynamic is, but if we look at these guys' example and we strive to follow their example in serving Christ, I'm telling you, it's not gonna be easy, but it's never gonna be wrong. It's always going to be right. Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer? God, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house and 
and just being able to open up your word and, and just sing praises to you. And God, you are the only one who's worthy of our worship. And so, God, I pray that as we move forward at the, in our service and we have the opportunity to respond and to, and to pray and to cast our cares and our burdens upon you, that, God, I pray that we would be willing to do exactly that. God, I pray that there would not be one of us who leave here not doing what the Lord Jesus Christ is laying on our heart to do. So God, I pray for individuals. I pray for families. I pray for our church family. God, whatever that looks like moving forward, help us to be committed with passion and energy and enthusiasm and help us to be committed and do things with affection and care in our heart. And God, help us to be willing to lay our own personal wants and desires and needs aside and risk our life for the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that something was said and someone was able to see something or hear something that will change their life forevermore, only made possible through the Holy Spirit of God. So God, please do what only you can do and do a mighty work in our hearts and lives. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen.